Hello, everyone. My name is Stephanie. I am the co-host of Debates Talks. Today is part two of our topic of white media and Black men. I have two lovely guests with me. I have Nakia. She is a MFA screenwriter candidate and former reporter. And I have Hanifa. With Hanifa, she is a longtime Indiana resident. Ms. Kali is the director of a civil rights agency in Northwest Indiana. She currently holds a professorship at Indiana University, provides legal services to indigent clients throughout the nation, and is running for U.S. Senate in Indiana in 2020 against incumbent Senator Todd Young. Welcome, ladies. How are you guys doing today? Thank you. Thanks. I'm, I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm, I'm ready to get this topic started because it's such a big heavy topic. So I'm, I'm really ready to dive right in. How about you? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Perfect. Perfect. So the first question I asked our guests last week was, has the media ever affected your perception of your own culture? And if so, how? I could start off with you, Hanifa. Yes, uh, well, I had noted uh, some things down here, but I will just say this very quickly, of course. Uh, you know, uh, as an African-American uh, woman, uh, you know, I uh, grew up watching TV just as, you know, many others, uh, many others have. And of course, there are always those stereotypes and, um, uh, narratives that are shown uh, on the TV predominantly, we know what they are, uh, the over-sexualization, uh, the uh, submissive uh, position. There, there's, there's, it's not that there's no African-American women leaders in this world and in, in this country, even it's just that we rarely see them. So uh, what I grew up with was what these, these stereotypes were depicting and um, either I uh, uh, wanted to be them or did not want to be them and had the urge to still be whatever they are because that's you know all that I saw so if it were not for the intelligent conversations that I would sometimes have with my mother or my older sister uh, then it it would have been very possible that many of those you know I would have probably fell into um, uh, those categories so yes uh, it definitely does happen and uh, we've got to um, notify these writers and these producers of what they're doing they've got to stop okay thank you for that how about you nakia has media ever affected your own perception of your own culture you know that's a really interesting question and when i saw it i i literally had to sit and think for a while because oftentimes what i've seen i don't always necessarily believe because it seems like it would be too easy of a story to tell yeah. and having um a reporter background, I always knew that there was always more to the story than what was written. Because I remember when I initially read about Trayvon Martin, it was such a, it was a blip. And I was like, this doesn't really make any sense. And I really didn't hear anything else about it for a very long time. And then all of a sudden the story just exploded. And I also remember when I initially heard about Breonna Taylor, no one was really seeing anything. And I kept going, there's got to be more to the story. And it just took so long for the story to come out. So it hasn't changed my perception, but it made me question what the actual story was, because I know there's more to it. It's just not this simple thing, because we have to write the simple story, but it's something deeper. And I'm always looking for that. And then with your perception being a reporter, what... So when were you a reporter? So t give me that timeline, because if in the second you became a reporter, did your perception change on how you write a story versus how you read a story? Yes, it did. Okay. And um, so I'm trying to do the timeline. My timeline, the easiest way for me to do the timeline for you is this. I became a reporter right before Barack Obama blew up. So two years before he went to the um, national, the um, Democratic National Convention, I was working as a reporter in High Park. And right after he blew up, High Park kind of got on the map. And that's when I was doing coverage for the city. And it was 
the way that I was looking at stories was the basic things. You're looking for the who, what, the where, when, why. That's how we were taught to look for it. And so when I'm looking at stories, that's what I'm looking for initially, always. So it did change because if I don't get all of that information initially, I'm skeptical of the story. Perfect, thank you, thank you. So you're saying the second after you became a reporter, then that's when it all starts to change because what perceptive, so what's your end goal as a reporter? Are you just trying to get the facts out there or are you trying to tell someone's side of the story or just the story as is? I'm trying to get the facts out there. So no matter what the story is, I want the facts to be given. That way that you can make the best decision because that's what it's always all about. And I'm trying to be just, just all about the facts all okay. the time. All right. Now, what are some of the common things that we see when we see the headlines when it comes to Black people? Hanifa, uh, what, what are some of the, what are some common um, headlines that you see? Yeah, well, uh, I think we all know what they are, uh, typically, uh, criminal activity, okay? Uh, for example, I'll just be honest with you, I'm a civil rights agency uh, director in, in Gary, uh, Indiana. I can't help but notice uh, what uh, the headlines always say about Gary. Gary is the only uh, uh, predominantly African-American city in the state of Indiana. And uh, typically what we usually see is negative press. Now, um, uh, of, of course, it is, you know, our opinion uh, that no city in Indiana has received as much negative press as uh, the city of Gary. So I think generally when it comes to African-American, black and brown uh, people, women, uh, these writers and producers, like I said uh, with the first question, they need to be more culturally aware uh, and sensitive as to how they are uh, presenting information. And if it's uh, like Nakia is saying here, is it the facts? Have they actually done the digging to find out what those facts are? And uh, so even if they haven't, they have the education and the training being culturally aware to understand that they may hold some biases that are having an impact on the news that they uh, report. And so, you know, for the city of Gary, uh, I cannot even begin to tell you uh, the, the negative press uh, that the city gets all the time. And it's just like, I live there, I work, live there, work there, I know what it's like. And it's definitely not as bad as what is being portrayed. And there's so much potential in the city uh, that it just hurts my heart every time. So. My hope is that all news uh, media sources will begin to reflect on uh, these types of uh, wrongs. Okay, and then what about you, Nakia? What are some of the common headlines that you see? Um, a lot of the common headlines that I see are about criminal activity. And what I initially, the thing that comes to me is that the image that shows up. For example, when they have the mug shots of different criminals who are black versus those, someone who, let's say, for example, the rape case, I know you all have seen it, any pick any rape case that you want. And there is more than <laughs> one Turner. where- Say that one more time. Brock Turner. Yeah, that's what I was thinking of. So Brock Turner, you get his picture, it's like his the um, class photo. But then there is another, any black man that I've seen who's had the same case and it's his mugshot. And I go, why is that happening? Why are we trying to paint this picture that Brock is this angel who we know has committed an act that's not good and the black guy gets a mugshot? Like he didn't have a class photo somewhere? It doesn't exactly. make sense. Too. And then the, the shot that we see now is now Brock Turner's mugshot, but that wasn't always the case. You're right. Some, a lot of women were like, no, like you need to change this mugshot because he was smiling and it, I think he was wearing a suit or something like that. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. When, when Brock Turner's headlines first hit, it was a class photo of him in a tuxedo and then eventually it changed to his mugshot. So, yeah. so yeah. So what can we do to alter these headlines and what can we do to alter the opinions of people? I'll, I'll start with you, Nakia. What can we do? What can be done? That is, I think, an incredibly tough question because it, it, it plays into a couple of things. One, people have to be open to change their mindset. 
and they really aren't a lot of times because it means that they're going to change something about them. And so you have to figure out how you can change the character to make them likable so that they can change their mindset. And that's not always possible as well. So it's one of those things where people have to want to do it. Mm. And how can you get people to want to change? Don't know. Mm. How about you, Hanifa? What, what, what do you think that can be done? Well, you know, uh, uh, to me, it's, uh, it's not rocket science. Sometimes you just don't watch them. And more importantly, you let them know why you're not watching. And I think uh, that's the, the most important part uh, is that we identify these writers and their stories because they always come from somewhere. And uh, like I said, we give them the cult uh, cultural awareness and the training that they need, but more importantly, we, uh, we hold them accountable mm. for their stories. Mm. So when we see something that we don't like or we feel that is biased in some sort of way, we, we hold them accountable. We contact these news sources, we contact the writers, we let them know that we're not watching, that we're going to share in fact bias uh, news report uh, with friends and family, and we're gonna let them know that we didn't appreciate it. And then we also uh, put it on record uh, by making a complaint to that particular uh, news source. So, um, and you know, like I said, uh, I think boycotting and saying, I'm not gonna watch this is good, but there's also something else, another piece that needs to come with that, which is the communication that that is being done and why. And then uh, as a follow-up question for you, Hanifa, is there anything legally that we can do to hold them accountable? Well, I think if there's any type of, of um, like I, I, I said uh, earlier, if there's any type of misrepresentation with respect and not, uh, you know, really digging and finding facts, like Nakia said, you know, you got a, a report where the facts aren't there, uh, you've got misrepresentation there, uh, maybe a little slander, a little libel, a little, you know, uh, bias. Legally speaking, you can uh, file a complaint uh, against these agencies. And uh, even if you cannot uh, afford representation, you can proceed pro se, uh, which is what a lot of people, uh, you know, tend to do because they can't afford a lawyer. But, you know, uh, companies like mine, we empower pro se litigants and we give uh, individuals across the nation the tools and resources that they need in order to file a complaint. And a lot of times you can simply go to uh, uh, government agencies and file reports uh, that are free that they will investigate uh, what's going on or what has been reported, you know, to see. And I think that it, the free route would be probably the best route, but if it's personal to you and private matter, then yes, I'll pursue uh, the civil uh, litigation. And I do appreciate that. Perfect. Yeah. Now let's move on to one of the main topics. In my last part one, we discussed Michael Jackson versus Stephen Collins. As you know, I'm, I'm a Michael Jackson fan, so there mm -hmm. is a little bit of a bias there, or a lot of it bias, but <laughs> as a kid, I remember all of the nicknames. I remember everything from sleeping in or sleeping with the oxygen tank to tank to buying the elephant man's bones and then he having the song leave me alone that went towards the press that was on his bad album i remember that so that's been going on since the early 90s and then it evolved he got negative press when he married lisa marie presley and then it got worse it became wacko jacko and then finally upon his death it's pedophile so and then last year was the documentary of leaving Netherland. So all of those things bothered me as a fan because it seemed like the media was very relentless. And if had he had done it, that's one thing. But there wasn't proof. The FBI raided his place, didn't find any evidence. He's been uh, what acquitted of the charges and so forth. But there's Stephen Collins. He actually admitted to child molestation and the media did nothing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share a clip from him, his actual interview with Katie Couric and you guys can see for yourself. You can see that he, he actually had, 
like I said, he admitted to it. So give me one second while I share my screen and bring all of that information up. Give me one second. The Seventh Heaven Star speaking out for the first time about those accusations detailing sexual. Stephen Collins, he played the virtual. I'm skipping forward to the actual he's undoing the release the of a 2012 audio recording of his confession during a marriage counseling session with his estranged wife, Faye Grant. The, the exposure happened a couple of times. A couple of times? You told me once. You no, know, I said on the list it happened several times. There were, I think, there were, yes, there were like three incidents over about three years. Following the October release of the tape, Collins had lost acting jobs, and the show that made him famous has been pulled from syndication. Now, for the first time on television, he's breaking his silence. Tell us what happened. Well, in 1973, there were two occasions when I exposed myself to this young woman. In an exclusive new interview with Yahoo Global... See what I'm saying? So... Right there, those are red flags. He told his wife it was one time. Then it was a three-time incident. When he was talking to Katie, it was two times. Then the language went from, because the, the, if you do the research, the girls were, one of the girls was 13. So she's a young woman versus a girl. So, and then out of all of that, no negative media press. He lost a few acting jobs, sure, but... But if you do research on him now, because this happened in 2012, there's news articles stating, oh, well, he got, came out unscathed, unlike Kevin Spacey, unlike Harvey Weinstein. They came, he came out unscathed, and now he's in Iowa, married to a 32-year-old fan, living out his life. So it's like, oh, okay, so, you know. This you, you could do all this and, and nothing. So ladies, please tell me, did one, did you even hear about any of this? And two, what are your thoughts on how the media reacted to this? Uh, I could start with you, Nakia. What, did you even hear about this? And what are your thoughts on it? I remember hearing about this story and I thought it was unusual, the press coverage, because he admitted to exposing himself to children it, 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 even to this day it, it still amazes me that more people weren't outraged or something else wasn't done to him in comparison with others because it's like this is assault technically yeah. so it, it yeah I'm, <laughs> I'm at a loss for words I mean truly he's yeah. living his life and that I didn't know it's like nothing happened it's like Oh yeah, I'm gonna go move to another state and go get married and just go live and oh my goodness. Exactly. Wow. You're you're literally lost for words, but yeah. how does that compare to Michael? Isn't that isn't that insane? It absolutely is. And for a couple of reasons. Um, unfortunately, because of who Michael Jackson was, everyone was just so enamored with him. They pro the possibility of him um, sexually assaulting children just didn't personally make sense to me. And so I guess that's the reason behind the media coverage because of the enamor for him, but how it continued to go on and go on and go on and go on even after his death, it's completely and totally amazing. Exactly. He said that even the, um, the Finding Neverland, I didn't want to watch it and I wasn't going to watch it because I never believed it, but the fact that people want to buy into that is completely and totally amazing and he was proven he was acquitted but yet right. we keep saying that he's a pedophile what right. and, is there exactly and then even when you speak to younger people they literally say oh michael jackson the pedophile that is in his name that is in his title like why do people when he died like why are people sad about those pedophiles like you got to be kidding me and it's like and and jokes or not that will forever be his legacy you mm. you can't get around that and then in my last uh podcast one of my friends said you know jared from subway subway knew about all this stuff 
This is true. They knew about all that stuff. It's like, oh, interesting. They knew about this and Jared didn't even get it. Jared did not get a third of the negative press. He doesn't have any nicknames. I haven't heard anything from Jared since then. Like Subway scrubbed clean of that. And it's like, he's living his life in jail or doing whatever he is, not a single word. So Mm -hmm. how about you, Hanifa? So going back to the original question, did you hear about the Stephen Collins story and what are your thoughts on this, even compared to Michael Jackson? Yes, I did. Well, you know, I will tell you, you know, I live in the area, I work in the area, and that's where uh, Michael Jackson comes from. And if you go down Broadway, uh, you'll see a giant um, mural of uh, Michael and his brothers. And uh, that's uh, how I remember Michael. Now, Michael, um, was a victim of abuse. And that's a lot of times what uh, I think if uh, our writers, our producers as a whole were culturally more aware and sensitive uh, to people's life. And I'm not uh, in any way excusing any type of behavior, uh, but Michael uh, suffered a great amount of abuse and uh, in his, his entire life. And it's just a very sad story uh, when you think about it, how he was treated in the media, how he just could not rest. He literally could not rest, mm-hmm. right? Could not sleep at night. Um, it was just a, a circus of a life for an individual who never uh, had an opportunity to be a child, you know, uh, before he was thrown off onto the stage to entertain. And so I do, I did notice a stark difference, a contrast between how Mr. Collins uh, was treated and how uh, you know, uh, Michael was treated. I think Mr. So, Collins- so you, did, given, so you did hear about Steve Collins. You heard this incident. Yes. Interesting. And uh, I think uh, maybe the media took his admission and decided maybe they were going to reward him uh, somehow for that, uh, I'm not. I'm not really sure why they decided to give the guy such a break. Uh, you know, I think you know Stephanie. Even in the law, I mean, we know that when individuals admit things and they talk in detail, great length about them, that you know, the, the, there's some sort of reward or exchange or something like that. So that's what um, you know. I see here happening here that maybe they thought, you know, we'll reward him. He's being honest. It's outside of the statute of limitations. Mm -hmm. What can we do? Um, You know, he's older uh, or whatever. We're going to give him uh, some sort of break, which, you know, I'm sorry. I just don't think it's fair. You know, Michael, uh, you know, he he, he, maybe he had uh, issues. Maybe he didn't. We don't know if he was acquitted like you said. And that's yeah. another thing too. Michaels was outside the statute of limitations as well, but that did not matter. That oh, it was within Stephanie. Um, which one? It, it was. It was within. Uh, there were a couple of them that were within the time period. I think it's nine, nine years or ten years. So you're saying the Jordan Chandler case was within the nine years? I, I, I'm. I'm not sure which one, but there were a couple of them that were within the statute of limitations. So the victims were well within their time period to file against him or the prosecutor uh, was. And I'd have to go back and do some more research, but I'm pretty okay. sure it was within because for Collins, all of those were outside of the statute of limitations. So when he went before uh, the news and confessed and did all these things, he knew exactly what he was uh, doing mm-hmm. and they couldn't come after him, even if they uh, wanted to. So you're saying that even with the confession, because it was leaked to TMZ, because the wife secretly recorded it, but he's thinking, okay, well, I'm fine to confess and do this interview only because no charges can be brought against me. I have a lot of reason to believe that when people confess things, uh, they've already spoken with their lawyers (laughs) and they know that they are safe (laughs) from... uh, being held accountable for things. And I would imagine Mr. Collins uh, with uh, his experience in, you know, uh, Hollywood and connections and all that, he 
course he's got lawyers uh, advising him and telling him what he should do or should not do or what he can say or not say, and there you go. And, and that's the interesting thing too, because when Wade Robinson came out with Leaving Netherland, they're saying that his case he couldn't sue because it went outside the statute of limitations, but also he flipped his story. He testified for the Jacksons and now he wants to bring a case against them. So that's why uh, there was, there's even proof that they're debunking uh, the documentary in itself. But moving on, let's discuss the next topic at hand of George Floyd versus Chris Watts. Now, when it comes to George Floyd, what are your thoughts on how all of his media coverage was handled? I can start off with you, Nakia. <laughs> I was reflecting because in comparison with Chris, George, I think he was made to be fall into that stereotype that they always try to do, that he was a criminal, he was doing wrong, so he should have gotten arrested. They should have had his, um, the knee on him to control him. So I think that's the image that they were trying to portray of him, which doesn't make any sense because he was just a person being a person and he should be able to do that. With Chris, it's incredibly weird because we know he killed his family. Yeah. He admitted to killing his family. He gave details about how he killed his children. And yet he gets this different coverage where people are just like in love with him for some reason. Women yeah. want to marry him. It's like, what? I and It's completely mystifying to me because I just don't understand how this story of a man killing his entire family, his babies. It, not even born. One of them was, yes. was yeah, exactly. Does, and I can't remember what did he he put them in the um what I never remember the name of that uh what he dumped them in I, it was like an because, oil tank thing yeah because I watched the documentary and the way that he describes what he did and then I read this letter about how the the one of them said daddy he did it anyway and I'm just like oh my goodness this is just the most disturbing thing it is in comparison with George Floyd who had a, who had kids, but he wasn't, but he wasn't seen as the soft person for some reason, because he was this giant black man. That's not, that's inaccurate. I mean, giant black man can be soft. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> and, and like, and I wanted to get into that because the language that was used and uh, it wasn't soft and they made sure they discussed a lot of weird stories came out about him. Is that he had a girlfriend, he was cheating on his girlfriend, then yeah. he went from girlfriend to having both a girlfriend and a fiance, and then yeah. it went from he had a wife and he was cheating on his wife with his girlfriend and so forth. Yeah. And then it was like this weird story of she's paid, she was paid by the media to pretend that she was the girlfriend. So yeah. that's that's insane right there. And yeah. and but yeah. So Hanifa, what, if, what about you? What were your thoughts on how the media handled George Floyd versus how they, do you, uh, do you know about the Chris Watts situation? Because I, I will show a clip of Chris Watts. Do you, have you heard of that? Yes, I'm very aware of that as well. You know, uh, Stephanie, I'm gonna have to agree with the situation. You know, when we first uh, discovered uh, what had happened to Mr. Floyd, uh, you know, uh, it seemed like the media was kind of, uh, you know, trying to get justice for him. And then all of a sudden it kind of changed. Well, now, wait a minute. We also want to make sure, you know, these bad things about him, mm -hmm. um, you know, and uh, it was irrelevant. It was mm -hmm. irrelevant. You have uh, two different individuals here uh, where I don't know if you had a chance to watch the absolute raw footage of Mr. Floyd's arrest and how they treated him. It's on YouTube if you haven't seen it. It is the most disturbing thing I've ever seen in my entire life. Um, they show the moment in which he's approached by police all the way up until his death in the ambulance. Like one of the police officers actually gets into the ambulance and has a body cam on him. And you see this whole thing uh, playing. Mm. But the way they first, uh, 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 approach
approached Mr. Floyd while he was still in his vehicle with a gun mm. for questioning. You're questioning him. What type over of threat, of this, right? Over what type of, of threat had he displayed for you to approach him with a gun? But yet, and still with Mr. Watts here, you have a, a, a gentleman who is confessing and saying all these things, and you're just kindly, you know, questioning him, peacefully questioning him about whatever's going on. But when it comes to making an arrest, you want to start out with a gun for a man who uh, uh, stated that he had been previously shot by police. So there's a general fear. There was a general fear that Mr. Floyd had for police and guns. And then he stated that he was claustrophobic in the footage. So when you're trying to push a large gentleman inside of a small uh, compartment in the back of a, a vehicle, and he's shouting and screaming that he's claustrophobic. Please don't shoot me. You know, I, I'm. I, what is it that you want? I, I'm afraid to get in the back of a vehicle. You ignored his claustrophobia. You ignored his general fear of police. You ignored his past experiences. And you put your foot on your uh, knee on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. And then even after he had died, even after he had died, you still were uh, restraining him still keeping him from moving when there was no movement whatsoever. So you're treating a man like this because he, he, he tried, he, because he may, we'll never know because he never got to stand trial, but you're treating him like this because he may have tried to use a fake bill. Mm -hmm. This is, this is absolutely ridiculous. He, because he tried to, may have tried to use a fake bill versus a man who has killed his entire family. Or, or is suspected of having killed his entire family, give me a break. Give me a break. So the way they approached him, the way they questioned him, the way they uh, uh, went ahead and arrested him, tried to put him into the back of a vehicle, uh, stating, you're not fair. Uh, listen, when you look at the footage, you can tell that Mr. Floyd is having a panic attack. Mm -hmm. All right? He's having a panic attack. Um, he's out of breath. He cannot breathe. He stated multiple times, I can't breathe multiple times. I would say at least 20 or 30 times. Now, listen, if I've got my, my knee on your neck or I'm restraining you and you're saying I can't breathe, why would I then say back to you? Well, you're talking, aren't you? That's what they said to him. Now, ladies, I am sorry. I, have gotten a, just a bit of uh, passion here, uh, and I'm sure you can tell, but this, this is ridiculous. This is absolutely ridiculous. Listen, if you've been suspected of a crime, no matter if you're white, black, brown, you're female, you're male, you deserve to stand trial. And yep. what our police and law enforcement need to understand with their homicidal track record is that they must get cultural awareness, uh, education, and training so that they can stop this disparate treatment of people during an arrest. Everybody deserves a chance to stand trial. Now, we'll never know if he uh, tried to use a fake bill or not because you, 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 uh, you suffocated him. And that's Again. another thing, too, because with the media press, that was conflicting information as well. Some sources said it wasn't even a fake bill. So that's the whole point. It went from the, the store clerk calling the police to report a fake bill to it might not even been a fake bill, but we'll never know because mm -hmm. he, he is death. And then, so right now I want to show just a, a few seconds of the documentary because I, I did it with, with the last, uh, I did it with the last segment that I wanted to show how, to, just to compare and contrast how he's being treated. So give me one second. Uh, Can you see my screen? Yeah. For our viewers, uh, this was from uh, the family and so forth, but. Hello, come here. Hey guys, my name is Shanann Watts. I live in Frederick, Colorado. Say hi, Cece. Say hi, Bells. Hi, Bells. No, you gotta say hi. Hi. And, um, can't forget 
Dieter. Here comes Dieter. Look at this. Okay, Daddy's not gonna do the thing he's falling off. Papa. When Chris and I got married, we moved out here after visiting. Fell in love with the area. It's gorgeous in Colorado. You see, look at that. Alrighty. That 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 was what? Not even 30 seconds. 30 seconds and it's smiling, you're playing family. I didn't even show the part where he's doing his little kid's hair. And, and, and automatically you're thinking, oh, what a good guy. What a sweet guy, mm -hmm. what a great father, you know? Mm -hmm. And in the last segment, my friend was like, well, that automatically makes you think that he had enough. So when he killed his family is that he snapped. You know, he's a great father. He did all this, but that was something happened where it's the last straw. But throughout the documentary, you're going to see text messages saying how much he loves his wife. I love you. You're wrong. I'm not cheating on you, you know, so forth and so forth. She thinks she thinks there was an incident that happened where she called out her his his mother for accidentally giving their daughter food that she's allergic to but in re reality he's been cheating on his pregnant wife for months and he initially said that it went from when I told her that I was going to leave she's killed our daughters and then I reacted by killing her the story then changed well actually let me go back because they brought him in for questioning he denied everything then he did a polygraph test. They told him he did not pass the polygraph test. Then he said the polygraph test was wrong. <laughs> then they're like, why don't you just confess? He still kept denying. They had to bring his father in. Then he finally confessed. And then his story even then was like, well, I didn't kill my daughters. And then finally in a letter, he confessed to killing his daughters. So the story changed a million times and, and so forth. And you can tell something was wrong because the, the, the Sh Sh Shanann's friend was more concerned and worried about her disappearance than he was. Because if your wife is disappearing, you have to have some type of worry. You have to have some type of concern. You might be crying, you might be nervous. None of those emotions appeared. Not when he appeared in front of the television, not when he in this documentary, but when you pan over to the, the friend, she was like, oh my God, I don't know what's going on. I'm talking to her mom. Here's here's her medicine and, and so forth. So so you and also there was the neighbor yeah. who said he's acting strange. Correct. Because he doesn't talk a lot. So that's always amazing how they didn't catch that and the coverage of it. So hmm. see, they did catch it. it. They caught it. But gee, if you remember what the police said, uh, the police kind of brushed it off. He was like, oh, well, there might be other reasons for that. Every single thing that was said, the police officer kind of brushed off. When he brought him for the polygraph test, they were rubbing his back. You know, are you okay? Even when they were confessing, it was very calm. Very, the way they approached him, even when they, even when they went to arrest him, it was very calm, very gentle, all of that stuff. Yeah. He didn't even get nervous until he didn't realize the fact that his neighbor had camera footage of the car at night. And then even the neighbor was like, he doesn't never load his car outside. He always loads it inside. So that's when he started to freak out because if the cop wasn't there, I bet if he told the neighbor that, then something would have happened to the neighbor. I, I feel it. So so what are your thoughts on the opening of this documentary? Like what are your what are your thoughts on that, Nakia? It was interesting how they were trying to paint the story of this bright shiny family that's lo loving and caring and you just know after knowing his story that that's really not the case. Mm -hmm. I that's what I initially thought. I'm like this is very very interesting. They're creating this alternative <laughs> kind of narrative for him which is incredibly interesting and and i can't fully blame the person who did the documentary but i also can because i i bet the person who made the documentary was trying to say he's actually a monster it starts off like this but he's actually a monster but no if he stands trial and they show this document everyone who saw the documentary on netflix they're already going to have this innocence 
in the mind because of this documentary because at one point he was a great father and George Floyd never got that narrative narrative he never got this loving father and he's playing with his kids and this 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 gentle giant he never got that so that's insane how about you Hanifa what are your thoughts on the opening of this documentary for Chris Watts well, certainly, uh, I agree uh, with Nikia once again uh, with what she said. You know, what we are witnessing here is an inequality, a great inequality, and a misrepresentation of, of uh, people and their lives and who they are uh, before they're caught uh, committing crimes or uh, may, maybe before they became suspects to, uh, you know, criminal activity. And I think once again, uh, it, uh, we have to reach back to where this information is coming from. Right? Mm -hmm. This information is coming from writers and producers mm -hmm. who are uh, culturally unaware and insensitive to the material that they are publishing and putting out. And what they have to do is, and actually what it takes is actually a, a knowledge of history uh, and, and, and uh, the track record of, of media sources and the information that they publish. They've got to be able to, to, to view the totality of the circumstances. See, this is what typically happens. You know, it's just like in horror movies. We know that if there is an African American in a horror movie, they're yeah, probably I... going to be the first ones uh, to get out of there. <laughs> you know? Exactly. And I hate that is the one thing that I, and I love horror movies. They're my favorite thing. But whenever I see a black person in the movie, I just know they're going to be out of there first. Yeah. We've got to send a message to these writers and producers and people who put these things together that we are aware of these things and we see these things. You know, it's, it's you know, so you're right. Uh, uh, this, this happened, he was portrayed as this perfect gentleman. And, you know, then of course we have what happened to George Floyd and he was never uh, depicted as that. So what we need are writers and producers to come up and out and, and do the same thing for George. Let's show some pictures and images of him with his family. Let's make a documentary about George. Yeah. We can make a documentary about any of these uh, individuals who committed crimes. But you know what? Let's do something about uh, 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 George. Let's let's put out some positive images about him. Because I even had a close friend tell me, you know, well, you want to be careful when you're using George's name and things. Uh, why? Well, yeah. you know, he was a, a he did have a criminal history. So, oh. Okay, and what is that? Myself, wow, and what does that have to do with anything at all? Yeah. Nothing. And what's Only because you wanted to have something to do with it. Exactly. Now you don't want to feel bad for him because he had may have had a criminal history. Which one of us, let he was without uh, a sense cast the first stone. Which one of us is entirely innocent in our entire life? All of us have skeletons in the closet. And as a matter of fact, we just haven't been caught yeah. <laughs> uh, for some funny. of the things. And then what's so, funny is that he was the he was a victim. He wasn't exactly, a murderer. Exactly. 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 That's what and people make it seem like when you see this photo of George Floyd, it, it it's it's almost as if he was a criminal that deserved to get killed. And he's actually the victim. Mm -hmm. And and people people don't want to they don't associate those two things. Now, one thing I, I do want to, one last statement before we go to our counterpoints is, have you ever noticed that the white collar criminals, they don't get the same disrespect? Besides jokes like Bertie Madoff, he, he got film deals. Um, Wizard of Lies was a film that came out about, I guess it's a mini documentary. He stole $65 billion. It's the largest pyramid scheme in US history. However, the film, was nominated mm -hmm. for two Golden Globes and four Emmys. And then Jordan Belfort, he, he wrote that book. He was a criminal as well, Wolf of Wall Street. Everyone mm -hmm. loves Wolf of Wall Street and he got rewarded for it. He, uh, nominated for five Oscars, two Golden Globes and over a hundred plus nominations. You know, it, so it's like interesting. White collar criminals, uh, 
who are white men, they they don't get that same disrespect. Who are actually done guilty of the crime? So, so that 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 amazes me that how someone who is guilty, you know, versus someone who may have been guilty, completely different things. But but now I want to segue onto the counter arguments. So as a reporter, we I might even rely heavily on you, Nakia, for that. So I guess one of the arguments will be about it's illegal to stifle the press due to the First Amendment. So what do you feel about that? Do you think that that's true? That because if we change this narrative, it's not 100% true. The objective of the media is, suppo is supposed to be to inform. That's all. We're so, and as I was reading your questions and I was looking at that, I was thinking about the accountability that we're supposed to hold and um, how reporters should be objective about the story. And, and oftentimes that's not the case. So um, in response, it, to me, this is a really, really tough thing because when I'm thinking about my journey, and I, I take journalistic ethics very, very seriously, I really do because I literally am all about facts all the time. It's really hard for me to think, believe that the we can do anything against the first amendment first amendment in terms of media coverage. I don't I don't foresee it happening because it would change everything. It would change everything. You're right. It would, really, it would change everything. And then another counter argument is that people can distinguish between an individual and what's being reported. And that's what people also forget to realize as well. Because when you talk to a normal person and, and we'll do a different ethnicity, I, you know, if we use Hispanics, for example, I'm not going to go up to every Hispanic and automatically think, well, that person is an illegal immigrant or they're a rapist and all these negative things that Trump says about them because I'm able to distinguish that. So that's one of the counter arguments. So what do you ladies have to say about that? Hanifa, what would you say about being able to distinguish between an individual and what's being reported? Well, I think uh, journalists all across the nation and probably the world uh, have a fight going on inside of them. And that is uh, what uh, sells versus what's, what doesn't sell, what information uh, gets shared and published more uh, uh, than others. And I think it's a duty to inform, uh, like Nakia said, versus the freedom of speech, which with freedom of speech, you get to say what you want, how you want, when you want. Mm -hmm. to inform it, I could also ask in form of what? In form of my opinion, in form of your opinion, what are you informing me of? Uh, you're informing me of what sells and what gets you uh, the ultimate attention, what gets mm -hmm. you awards. And unfortunately, uh, people are the ones who have to decide, uh, you know, what type of information they want, you know, if they want to go after a, a news source or whatever that has a, a credibility to it and trustworthiness, or if they're going to go after uh, one that just simply exaggerates things and uh, 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 makes things entertaining. And I think what's winning now is uh, what makes things entertaining and yeah. what makes things, uh, who, what gets me emotionally riled up. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, people, I think, are the ones that have to determine when they're going to turn that mess off and turn on what really, uh, you know, is the facts and what really matters and, and what is really truthful versus uh, this entertainment aspect. I think it's a constant fight with the media and with the, uh, people in public opinion. And, yeah, and I totally this, agree. I was going to say that it's hard to change the mindset of someone who's reading a news story because you literally have to go and figure out if this information is true. And nine times out of 10, most people, when they see that first thing, that's it. And they just go with it. And it's like, no, that's not the story. You have to keep looking to verify this information to make sure it is actually correct. But people do not do that. And that's one of the biggest problems I typically have with stories that are shared on social media people aren't looking into it. It's just like, let me just pass it on. No, I'm like, no, look into this, verify this somewhere else. Go look and see if somebody else is reporting this. See how true this actually is. Because it could just be somebody saying something because people like to talk. 
Right, and that and that's another thing too, is because what if no one else is reporting it? So, and how long will it take for someone to counter that actual narrative? That that's one of the things too. And people don't. You're right. They don't want to do it. They don't have time to do it. So, mm-hmm. it, it's just like. And then what I've noticed as well is that a lot of journalists are quote unquote lazy. They word for word use the same exact information and the same exact everything as someone else reports it if tmz reports something and then cnn does it then and then i'm not saying cnn cnn does that but i'm giving an example but there have, i've seen other times where other mm-hmm. reputable sources will copy and paste the same exact information i'm like so were you there or like are you do you That's have the state of journalism that? right now? You're aggregating the news. All you have to do is cite the source to say that you got it from TMZ or from some other other place, and that's it. So you really don't have to, like you're saying, they're being lazy. You don't have to um, dive deep into anything because you're trying to get the news story out there because you're trying to get the shares, which means because you're trying to get the clicks. So yeah, you're absolutely right. If I, and if I may add, also, you know, journalists are under a lot of times an extreme amount of pressure. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, they want to keep their jobs, yes. mm-hmm. and unfortunately, they may be working under a boss or in a company of owners that are driven by uh, ulterior and political motives. Yes. So when they come up with a story and it doesn't publish or sell the way they want it to, they're out the door. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think uh, as an industry, um, there needs to be reform, and there needs to be, um, uh, it, it needs to be made a safer place. Mm-hmm. For, for real journalism and mm-hmm. yeah and, and and then i was going to say let's look at kobe because when kobe had passed away tmz was the first to report it and then everyone else reported it throughout the day and and everyone's such in a rush to report things first that we're almost a little they're almost a little bit skeevy about even reporting it because Mm -hmm. reporting something so high profile as Kobe's death is like how the hell did you even know that because you know people magazine didn't even report it until like three four hours later but but the moment it happened Kobe's family didn't even know about it and they had Mm -hmm. to find out on TMZ so thankfully now uh Vanessa she's doing something about it so she's you know she's starting to sue certain places I don't know if she sued TMZ but she's starting to make some traction about getting the laws changed because uh there are pictures at the site of the helicopter crash that was disgusting uh just disgusting just to even people are so obsessed of what's going on. They want to verify that it's true, that it's like you have no respect for his life. And then what was even more disgusting is the same day that this was reported and confirmed that it was true, his rape allegations came up. They, and then, and then that brought me to thinking about, someone said a while ago, if there was a black man that's a celebrity, he cannot leave this earth without a scandal attached to his name. So the media has this agenda of uh, trying to attach a scandal to every single black man before they leave this earth. And thankfully, Chadwick Boseman was able to leave this earth without any scandals, but still, like, there, there's, there, Bill Cosby has his, R. Kelly has his, James Brown had his drugs thing, you know, every single one of them, that they're trying to attach something negative. So when we think about it, that is, correlates to it. That's interesting because I saw the opposite, just because I'm a reporting. I, and I totally understand what people say about that because I think that if you're telling Kobe's story, you have to include it because that, that is a part of his story. You do. It's not the best part of his story, but it's a part of his story. It actually made changed him to, to do a lot of different things because if you think about what he had done after that allegation, he became a better person. So you have to mention that. I mean, think about all the things that he was doing for women's basketball. And that's simply because he because of this case and because he had daughters. I The reason why I disagree with that, and I don't want to spend too much on Kobe, is the fact that I would not do that so soon after he died. I wouldn't do it the same day, the same week, so whatever. I think that because of those allegations and it wasn't proven that it should be swept under 
kind of like swept under the rug that 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 is kind of an incident that happened because you know what's interesting when I did my research about Steven Spielberg I had to dig deep to find about how on set that people have died or when filming the Twilight Zone and it's nowhere on his wiki it's nowhere on his IMDb page uh there was an incident between him and John Landis and it's like what is this about and then the more I dug about it it was like oh yeah uh there was an incident where multiple people had died on the set while filming the Twilight Zone and and uh they or I thought it was um Poltergeist no, it was the Twilight Zone because it was a helicopter scene. Oh, and okay. They were there overnight. They didn't have the permits. Children mm. were there. There were children that died and so forth. It, it was such a big scandal. And it's attached to John Landis's name, but not mm. Steven Spielberg. And the only reason why John Landis is back to where he was was because of Eddie Murphy. Because mm. Eddie Murphy uh, pitched to pitched to the studios that he wanted him to film coming to America. So, and then they got rid of their beef and whatnot, but uh, cause Eddie Murphy liked him filming Trading Places. He wanted him to do uh, coming to America, but, but yeah, all of that happened, but you have to dig for all that information. And, and that's not the first thing you think of when you think of Steven Spielberg. So why mm-hmm. is it the first thing that I think of when I think of Kobe, it shouldn't be a rape back allegation. That's, that's all I wanna say. So the last few comments that I'll make about counter arguments are, there are more black journalists that that can also counter the argument. Nakia is a perfect example of a black journalist that can do something good to help promote more positive stories. Even bad press is good press. Without the press, George Floyd's case wouldn't have seen much traction because the outrage went nationwide. The protests happened. Uh, Black Lives Matter. The people are starting to understand Black Lives Matter more, which is, which is good because before people misunderstood it as we're thinking that only only our lives matter or our lives are more important. But because of the George Floyd case, that helped to see like okay well you know we could do other things uh another kind of argument is that uh, white collar criminals found a way to thrive under their negative background and if any awards that happen to actors who made the film doesn't meet, make the criminal popular it just makes the people who betrayed them popular so those are just a few counter arguments that happen that that I even thought of, but doesn't ex- uh, excuse the negativity surrounded by our names. So with the last few minutes left, what are your final thoughts on this topic? Because I didn't even get a chance to talk about R. Kelly versus uh, uh, Hugh Hefner or uh, well, Bill Cosby versus Hugh Hefner and then uh, R. Kelly versus Harvey Weinstein. Uh, Though I didn't give it a chance to even talk about those, but uh, Hanifa, what are your final thoughts on this overall topic? Yes, well, my final thoughts are just going to be simply this, and I opened up uh, with it in the beginning that I strongly believe journalists, reporters, uh, as well as uh, individuals in all areas and industries need cultural awareness and uh, sensitivity training bias training. You know, Arizona State University conducted a study several years ago, and they stated that uh, prejudice and bias is actually natural, and it is a form of protection that all humans have. However, given that, uh, that does not mean we cannot curb our responses and make our responses better. So because we know that we may have an innate to protect ourselves from things that are different from us, we can understand that we have that thought and we can do better as a culture, as a society, as human beings and treat each other better. Learn as much as you can about what you don't know. Mm -hmm. Expose yourself to what you don't know. Find out about it, research it, spend time with it. You know, it's not enough to say, well, I've got a few friends that are, or I've got a few friends and a relative that's, Mm -hmm. no. Spend time and understand the culture and understand each other. And when we begin to do that, then everything that we, that everything else that we do and say changes, our language changes. So the actions that we, 
how we publish things and how we write. We know that last week, we, or we have a history of only doing a, a story on a certain ethnicity and a certain culture. Let's change it up now because now we understand what we're doing. Absolutely. And so that is going to be my, uh, my last thing is just simply get the cultural education and training that you need to change and also uh, hold uh, these media sources accountable for their bias. Perfect. Thank you. How about you, Nakia? What are your final thoughts on this? Um, well, a couple of things. I know Hanifa brought up something, and I just wanted to comment about it, about having producers in the room that can change the story. That's one of the reasons that I decided to um, pursue screenwriting and become an MFA candidate, because I did want to change the narrative. I see what's going on. I don't like it. I don't think it represents who we are as a people, and we need. I wanted to do something about that. And the good thing about that is that the people in my cohort feel exactly the same way and they're not all black. So I think this is a good thing. In addition, I'm optimistic about the future because there is um, a group called YR Media. They work with young journalists of color to try to change the narrative. So I'm, I'm gonna be optimistic about <laughs> the stories that we're gonna see in the future because I know that, um, because I know one of the executive um, directors over there she's working with them and she's also asking me to contribute to some things to help out with them so i'm optimistic perfect i i, I appreciate both of you ladies thoughts on this topic my final thoughts would be to wrap up both part one and part two is that yes i agree the media has to do so much better because my own perception has changed but i had to expose myself to my own culture. Thankfully, uh, we're from the Midwest. Uh, me and the Kia are from Chicago. We're able to go to different Black yeah. people because we have them as family members. <laughs> we have them as family members. We have them as friends, classmates, and so forth. But that's still not enough because in schools, they need to teach us. It, it can't just be on media. They need to teach it in schools. They need to, uh, you know, not have that in the entertainment industry as far as music and so forth. Yeah, no, you can't control the imagery, but you kind of can because there, there are scouts out there who are specifically looking for a specific type of look. You can not have neighborhoods be segregated. You can not, you can change and stop any type of racist behavior. You can't, Give someone a slap on the wrist for racist comments, racist jokes, uh, racist viewpoints, any of that. It has to stop because I can't default to, oh, it was only a joke because I don't make those type of jokes because I don't think that they're, the purpose of a joke is to make someone laugh and make me feel better. Why would you think if it's at my expense that I would feel better about this joke or I would look at myself in that context? You have to be cognitive, uh, or I'm saying that word wrong, you have to be aware of how I will respond. It's not about me being sensitive, it's about you taking accountability of you being insensitive and you're you don't care about how I feel, you care about how you feel and you're projecting however you felt over the years. You have this commentary, whether you got it from sports, whether you got it from the very few black people that you've been around or the black few black friends that you have. And mm -hmm. an another thing you have to do is if you do have your one black friend, you need to give them a safe space to be able to give their viewpoint because oftentimes the black friend mm -hmm. doesn't feel safe enough to truly feel how truly say how they feel because they're outnumbered and there is always going to be met with some type of resistance is going to be met with some type of argument of state and, and some people who are not argumentative are going to kind of retreat and, and, and recant their statements and, and they don't want to even speak out anymore. So they're, they don't have a safe space and you have to create that safe space, safe dialogue, take accountability and so forth. So those are my final thoughts. I This show will air next Thursday. There's gonna be a lot of editing done. <laughs> and I want to thank you ladies again. It was a pleasure speaking to you about this. And then if you have anything else to say, then please let me know. But you guys have a good afternoon and you're more than welcome to come back on future shows.
Okay. Thank you. Ladies, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. It's only entertainment. entertainment. <laughs>